right, we are live. Okay, great. Welcome um, to our program with Shannon Pump. I'm Jess Renke. I am the building manager at the Crest Pavilion. I'm joined with Morgan Mann, who is the community, community relations director for the Door County Library System. Hello. I'm a co-conspirator on all these programs. Um, and then Shannon Pump, who she, I've, I've gotten to see her presentations before. I've, I've eaten some of the mushrooms that she's foraged. She's a seasoned naturalist um, and teaches people. How long have you been doing it for? Um, teaching, I've been doing for about seven years now. Um, oh, yeah, and she, mushrooming a lot. <laughs> a lot yeah, so, so she is, she's a master forager actually, and she lives in Sister Bay. So obviously she knows lots about Door County mushrooms and now is running a garden center at Door Karma Farm. So thanks so much for, for being on today on the Crest Pavilion Door County Library program talk show. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for having me. All right, so am I just going to get her going here? Yeah, go right ahead. Yep. All right. So yeah, so just so people know, um, we're going to have everyone hold their questions to the end. If you're on Zoom, feel free to punch those into the chat bar. And then if you're not watching us on Facebook, Morgan will be watching for any questions or comments. So OK, sorry, Sharon. Shannon, take it away. No, that's great. Um, yeah, questions totally. That would be a wonderful thing if we could just keep them to the end and we can kind of whip through. There's a lot of information here for you guys today. Um, we're just starting out with a, a Wild Door LLC picture that my daughter took. Um, and the first few slides are just going to be a little bit of our story, like how we got started. Um, and then just some photographs of the mushrooms here from Door County. Um, just to give you an idea of what our biodiversity is, because it's it's huge in this county. We have a lot of mushrooms here, um, a lot of edibles, and there's a lot to cover. So I'm just going to get started here. Um, so how we ended up starting was was this picture, and I apologize that it's so pix pixelated, but um, my daughter and son and I were out hunting mushrooms, and um, we came across this area of morels that was insane. I have a three megapixel cell phone and two photos of this actually happening. It's an extremely rare find. It was well over 300 pounds of mushrooms. Collectively, it went up the hill, down the hill, behind us, in front of us, across the path, down the path. I mean, it was just insane. So I got stuck with a lot of these mushrooms. Um, <clears throat> we picked as much as we could, and then we started selling them to chefs. And chefs were like, hey, can you find Hen of the Woods? Can you find chanterelles? Can you find this? Can you find that? And I was like, yeah, I can find all those things. And um, so that's just kind of how Wild Door started. <clears throat> um, they, they started buying them from us. I realized it could be something I could do. Um, and so Wild Door was born. Um, shortly after we got the business up and running, um, I started working for the Ridges Sanctuary and they asked me to do some classes teaching about wild mushrooms and that's how I got my start teaching. Um, so that's kind of our, a little bit of our story, a little bit of my background. Um, I'm currently working at Door Karma Farms as their, as their garden center specialist and I'm also working as um, their mushroom girl as well still. So, um, so these are just going to be some pictures of morels. There's lots of different varieties of morels. Most people call them blacks, blondes, grays. You can call them whatever you want. But um, one of the cool mushrooms that we have up here that's not all over the place as far as the blondes go is morel prava, which grows usually with water and sand and so on and so forth. And we were lucky enough to come across a couple of spots in Door County that um, that mushroom actually exists. So I just wanted to share that frame um, another black morel, blonde morel that was hanging out in my yard. Um, the reason I put this slide in there is because you can actually, like, once you clean your mushrooms up, you can throw that stuff in the grass in your backyard, and sometimes it'll come, sometimes it won't. In this case, it did. All 32 of them while I was mowing lawn and had shut my lawnmower off so I could pick the mushrooms. Um, wow. So I stopped to take a picture, you know, of that mushroom. So just a neat little foliota. Um, we call these the Green Bay Packer mushrooms. Um, my son, the mushroom as big as his head. Um, and this is just showing you a little bit of the biodiversity and the different kinds of mushrooms that are out there, <clears throat> different shapes. Um, 
Some are very, very tiny. That's actually an acorn with tiny little mushrooms inside of it. Um, sometimes they get weird water caps on the top of them, which I can go into for a long period of time, the details. This is my daughter staring at a tree of artist conks where she was gonna choose one to draw on the back of. Um, and then we held a class with that. And these are some of the pictures from that class. So just go through those. Um, this is a very small area. Excuse me while I get a drink. My mouth is really dry. It's probably like a half acre of woods and this is all the varieties of mushrooms I found in just that little half acre in about 30 minutes. <clears throat> so Door County can be a really big wealth of mushrooms if you're out there. And then we're gonna stop here for a second and just talk about what is a mushroom. So this is really just showing you like the life cycle of a mushroom. And the reason that I go through this stuff is because you guys need to understand a little bit about it um, as far as your picking goes, as far as like cleaning up after them goes and so on and so forth, but also for ID reasons when we're asking you questions. So, you know, we, we have your cap up at the top of the mushroom and that cap is full of spores. That's those spores then circle around and you can see with the spores, they're just tiny, tiny little itty bitty things. Those spores germinate in the ground, they turn into mycelium. That mycelium stays under the ground. It's doing all sorts of business down there, develops into the primordia, and then eventually that primordia will fruit, and that is your mushroom. However, when the mushroom is up, the primordia and that mycelium is still down in the ground. So when you're taking a mushroom out, you're cutting it off or you're pulling it out, the actual organism itself is still in the ground. So you're not doing a lot of harm by taking the fruit. Kind of like picking an apple off a tree if you will um, and for id reasons we just go through like the top of the mushroom being called the cap the underside is gills it can have pores too um, the annulus we call it the ring um, or ask you if it has a veil that's another name for it stipe or stem that's going to be your length in your mushroom well but you don't find on every mushroom um, a lot of mushrooms don't have it, but we ask you that question because if it does have a really pronounced vulva or it does really have a pronounced base to it, it helps us to ID it. So those are parts that we may ask you about when we're asking you for information to ID your mushroom. Say you're sending me a picture or you're talking about it to me on the phone or whatever, I might ask you these questions. So getting to know what the names of those parts of the mushroom can be really important. Um, we're gonna go on here to how they work. <clears throat> so if mushrooms really weren't around, our world would be a lot different place. They play a really important role in breaking down plant and animal matter. Um, and then after the, that degrading happens, the remains are used by other plants, animals, and even us humans. So they're really a very vital part of our life network. <clears throat> they're unable to really produce their own energy. So it's kind of live in a relationship with some other organism. Um, there are certain funguses that live with orchids, and the orchids rely specifically on that fungus, and that relationship is what may or may not cause that thing to flower, whether or not it can have um, additional um, growth coming off of it. It's, it's just really a very amazing thing. Um, but basically, in exchange for the sugar from the plants, the mushroom species will provide stuff to them as well. So they're always kind of shaking hands. Um, and helping each other along. And they can have lots of different types of relationships with plants and trees. Some of them really clean up. They're like saprophytic. They're, they're just kind of breaking things down and they're, they're trying to help just degrade the soil. Um, and then there's some that kill um, the parasites. Um, and then those are the ones that get into your trees sometimes and cause funguses and your trees start to rot from the in inside out. And then there's the ones that work together. <clears throat> and they call that like a mycorrhiza um, relationship. And the ones that work together, this is kind of what they're doing. So the trees and mushrooms are shaking hands. They're sharing information, they're sharing food. They have their whole little network going on underneath the ground. And there's a reason that's important to you. Mushrooms grow at the base of their knees from specific species or decaying matter. Um, but most edibles, they're tree specific. So once you know what trees those edibles like, it's gonna cut your hunting time in half. And on top of that, that's the secret to mushroom hunting. So it's not as hard as you think it is. 
you just have to understand what mushrooms like what tree. You can walk into a forest, it might be a maple forest, and if you're not looking for maple mushrooms, there's absolutely no reason for you to be there. Why be in a maple forest if it's not a maple loving mushroom? Waste of time. So getting to know those trees, you can literally just walk from tree to tree to tree to tree, oak to oak to oak to oak, and find your mushrooms and skip over all the rest of that stuff. Unless you're like me and you're getting distracted and taking pictures of everything. Um, so, and then we get into tree ID. So the reason I put this slide together and it's kind of hastily put together, I threw it in because somebody suggested it at my last class. There's ways for you to learn your trees in spring for, for morel hunting. Um, that's where people are like, I don't know how to tell this. I don't know how to tell that. So there's ways for you to do that. You can get into these tree ID sites and you can learn about tree silhouettes. So when trees don't have leaves on them, they all have a specific shape. And if you can start to memorize the shapes of those trees that have the morel mushrooms on them, you're gonna have better luck looking for them. So I can actually drive around and look in the woods and I can see an ash. I can see an ash just by the way it's shaped. Then I go up and make sure it's an ash by checking the bark. So that's why the bark ID is here. There's also some places where you can get these, um, where it's the bark, the berry, the tree, the whole nine yards. Don't quite like those as much as I like just the online forms going in and looking at tree silhouettes and the tree bark. Um, just little helpful things that, that'll save you a ton of time um, and help you find the mushroom that you're actually looking for. Um, so just, I'm putting that out there. You guys can go online, you can look this stuff up. It's, it's fair game, Google has it everywhere. Um, you can get great resources from your libraries for that kind of thing. Um, and it's just a really helpful way to find the mushrooms. Um, so I'm just gonna go through collection supplies real quick. When I go out, I take out a knife, vegetable brush, and or specialty knife. I have a lot of knives. I don't even discriminate what knife I'm taking as long as I have something to cut the mushrooms with. It doesn't have to be a fancy knife. It could be a butter knife. Um, just as long as you have something to cut off the part of the mushroom that is close to the soil. And I'll talk about why you're doing that in a minute. I take along spore bags. They're just like laundry bags. I use those a lot. I use baskets and I use paper bags. Um, when I'm hiking, when I'm going out for a long period of time, I do, I take a backpack, I put water in there, a mushroom book if I need it, um, take mosquito spray, water, compass, maps, whistle, and pepper spray if I'm going into bear territory. I have seen bear not in Door County, um, so I'm always a little overprepared when it comes to hunting in my northern spots. <clears throat> I don't use plastic. I don't use plastic bags. I don't throw them in my bag. I just don't put mushrooms in them. It causes your mushrooms to get super duper sweaty. People are online are saying, well, they're, they're not using plastic bags because it allows for the spores to do this or whatever. Your spores can't go anywhere if they're in a plastic bag. Um, on and on and on about spores. And, and yes, having them in a basket or having them in a mesh bag, the, the spores don't really fall out of a mushroom. They float. They're like smoke, if you will when they're coming out of the mushroom. So as long as you have an open basket or open bag, the, the spores can float out, but that's really not where the argument should be. The, the thing with using plastics is your mushrooms get really super sweaty. Sweaty mushrooms lead to bacteria. It leads to your mushrooms starting to break down. If you have mud and dirt all over it, you just made a huge mess of every mushroom that's in that bag. So just using that basket and using the, um, those open bags just allows for your mushrooms to get the air that they need. This is really why plastic is bad. If it's the only thing you have in your car is a Walmart bag and you run into a chicken in the woods on your way home, put it in a plastic bag. <laughs> it's fine. It's not going to kill the mushroom and make it all terrible or whatever else. If it's all you have, it's all you have. I just don't make a point to take those things with me when I'm going out. Um, so this is just all about your mushrooms being a lot happier um because they're not sweating you know they're they're breathing they're able to um not get sweaty they're able to just be the mushroom that they're supposed to be the less liquid with mushrooms the better mushrooms are 90 percent water so i don't really see any reason to add more water to them just an example of some of the baskets and bags that we use um the, 
the morel picture there, that's part of that harvest that I showed you from that first slide. So that tells you like, that's a soccer ball bag. And it, well, um, it was it was really an amazing day. Um, and that, that gets us to this collection of cut or pull. Um, there really isn't much of a difference. Um, you aren't hurting anything if you pull that mushroom out of the ground. You're actually stretching the mycelium a little bit. Some mycelium actually respond positively to being stressed like that, and they actually will fruit again or fruit more. Um, and some mycelium just doesn't even care. The fruit is the fruit of the mushroom. The actual organism itself that created that fruit is staying in the ground. But pulling mushrooms out is not gonna hurt anything. The best way that I find to collect them is by using a knife. So sometimes I pull them out and then I use my knife or sometimes I take them off the ground with the knife. The whole point of having that knife is to cut off all the dirty stuff and leave it behind in the woods. So you don't have to take it home. It's gonna cut your, cut your cleaning time in half. It leaves all the dirt behind. You don't have one dirty mushroom in a basket of 50 and then you're gonna have 50 dirty mushrooms. So it's better for you to just try to clean it up, field dress, that's what we call it, in the woods while you're out there, get that stuff done with. Um, so when you come home, you just really have to worry about where are you putting your mushrooms, what are you gonna put them in, how are you gonna store them, and who's, who's having what for dinner tonight. I'm gonna talk a little bit about Amanita. Amanita, um, you can say it however you wish. Door County actually has a pretty healthy population of this mushroom and it is extremely toxic. Um, it's not something you wanna mess around with. Um, I tell people often, this, just kind of stay away from the white mushrooms until you really get to know what you're doing. Um, in their small stage, when these guys first come out, they can be mistaken for button mushrooms by somebody who doesn't really know what they're looking for. So, and when they grow up, this is, this is kind of what they look like, but it's, there's five signs. So, and that's why I did this, was just to kind of get you to remember that there's five different things that are involved with the Ambonita. So you're gonna have white scales on the cap. You're gonna have a white ring or veil, remember what that is. I can't show you because I, I'm sitting here at home, but you're gonna have white gills, you're gonna have that white vulva sac, and you're gonna have a white stem. So it's all white, the whole mushroom is white. Stay away from it. Um, you can touch them. They're not gonna kill you just for touching them. Um, you would actually have to ingest this mushroom for it to make you sick. However, it is just definitely not something that you want to mess around with. Um, I find them in all sorts of different areas. It doesn't seem that they like one tree or another tree or this or that. I've, I've seen them in grassy areas. I've seen them in fields. I've seen them underneath oak trees. I've seen them underneath every tree I can think of almost. I've even seen them in people's yards. So it's the one mushroom up here that I try to st steer people away from completely don't want to create mycophobia. The thing with this mushroom is just that it can be toxic. You don't want to put it in your mouth, okay? If you do have problems with this specific mushroom, if your dog ate it, your kid tried to eat it, whatever else, call a poison helpline right away. Because um, it, it can literally shut down your, your liver and your kidneys. It can be dangerous. So um, it's one of those things that I do like to cover just for that reason. Um, people see those white button mushrooms out there and they think that that's the same thing and it's just, it's just not. So um, just a little little bit of a visual for you on, on the most poisonous mushroom here in, in Door County. And then we're just going to go over a few of the mushrooms. Um, I'm going to touch base on the most common easy edibles is what I'm going to do. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of um, information on them and then what trees to get to know. So the Marcella species, we have like 170 some species right now um, that are identified. They all kind of look really close to the same, but they're not. They have that distinctive like honeycomb cap and a network of like pits and ridges. The center of that mushroom, when you cut it open, should be hollow. If it's not, then it's a variety of mushroom that you might want to consider taking caution with eating. And I'll get into that in a little bit here. Um, for Door County, we find them mostly on, um, on the poplar trees, ash trees. And this year, I found them all over underneath apple trees, which was interesting to me. I know they grow on apple, 
but I don't see it as often as I do the ash and the poplar. And this year the ash and poplar were really low and the apple trees were all full of mushrooms. So I don't know if that's just because of the way the weather worked this year. It was kind of a really bad year for mushrooms. Um, so we did find them on, on the apple and I know that um, ash trees, it's, it's not really specific. It's not green or white. It seems to be all of them up here. Um, the poplar trees, it's generally the whole grove. If you find one under poplar, they, they have a tendency to like put up a grove of trees. It'll be the whole grove. So once you see one, just stop, squat down a little bit and look because you take two steps and kick the next one over. They have a tendency to grow several in a grove. And in fact, that first picture I showed you of all of those morels in one area, that was a grove of poplar. That's and it was all around, and it was only on the poplar that those mushrooms were really growing. So um, May, all the way into June, um, so this, this last week was our last week here for the lawn morels being done now. Um, and then the next step is, is usually the oyster mushroom. And I'm kind of doing these in their consecutive order, how they pop up here in Door County. Um, and this mushroom's pretty, easy to find in Door County um, because we have a lot of beech trees here and that seems to be the most common species in Door County um, that I find this mushroom on and because our beech are actually suffering right now from um, this European beech disease they have a scale on them and it's kind of rotting them out for the middle these trees are busting off and that is just an absolute opportunity for this mushroom to start taking over generally when you find them you'll find it like this the vast majority, if not 90 some percent of these photos are my own photos. This went literally all the way up the tree. So when you get into a situation like that where you have a ton of mushrooms, that's where that big basket, that market basket comes in handy. Um, I literally will take sticks off the ground um, to knock them down and then try to catch them to put them in the baskets. Um, so the logs can be up and they can be down. This can grow on a living tree, a dead tree, or somewhere in between, you know? Um, and oftentimes it, it grows in, in masses like this. Um, so our most common is beech, but I do see them on oak, maple, aspen, poplar. Um, as they exchange to different trees, they're actually like in the plur Pleurotus family, but then they're maybe um, a, like a slightly different species. The vast majority of them will smell like anise or like black licorice. It's faint. Um, as far as collection, I try to take them when they're super duper fresh. I check them for flies. I check them for maggots before I go taking it off home and then realizing that they're, they're spent. I will tell you that if you see a whole lot of gnats around those, I just leave them. Um, they are going to be full of bugs and you can soak them in salt water all you want. If they're not coming out. So I would just leave them be then at that point. But a very, very simple mushroom goes well with just about anything you can put it with. Um, Moving on to the Cantharellus family. So Door County has another, you know, really abundant supply of the chanterelle. Um, again, because of the beech and oak that we have, that seems to be their tree of, of choices. I sometimes find them in hemlock, but mostly in beech and oak. It does have a look-alike. Um, it does have one that's a dangerous look-alike. However, I don't see a lot of it here. And I'm not saying that you should um, just throw caution to the wind and, and eat it anyway, please don't do that. I'm gonna give you a little bit of background information on this, just so that you can kind of see the difference between this and its lookalike friend. Um, they smell deeply of apricot and they're mildly peppery. I have, I've canned them, I've froze them, I've dried them. I can't find a way I don't like them. Um, black trumpet, generally if you find the uh, the chanterelle, you're going to find these guys hanging out almost within feet of it. They're, again, another beech oak lover. Beech and oaks, oak trees are cousins. Um, so that would be why we're, we're seeing all these mushrooms hanging around on those two particular trees. Um, I've also seen them in hemlock too, but they really like those mossy mounds. They like wet areas. These are water mushrooms. The more rain you get, the better the fruiting. Um, if it's a real dry summer, you might have a hard time finding them. 
they come back in those same areas every year because that mycelium stays in the ground behind them. So I've seen them as early as June and I've seen them actually as late as November. Um, so they they blend in really well with the leaves, um, but then once you see them, you see them and then you're gonna see them everywhere. So it's, it's kind of a real small mushroom when it comes out and it just looks like little holes from the top when you're looking down. But if you give it a week or two, they actually can be the size of the palm of your hand. They get quite large. Um, another uh, really, really great mushroom and also one of my favorites is the Heresium family. We actually have all three varieties here in Door County. Um, there's two of the three species pictured here, um, but they all look relatively pretty close to the same. They're all edible. Um, and they're, they're again, hanging around with the beech, the ash, the oak, the maple. It's, it's really a lot of hardwood trees. Um, I've seen them on conifer as well, but not as common as, again, those, those beech and ash and oak. That seems to be their favorite trees. We cook them with butter and soy sauce. It's just hands down one of our favorite mushrooms. This mushroom is also being studied for some medicinal properties. Um, there's a lot of really good stuff coming up with this mushroom. Um, so just kind of keep your eye on that. They're, they're looking at um, using it for treating Alzheimer's and a few other things too. Um, I guess it works well with our neurons. So um, it's a really inter interesting mushroom to get to know. And my kids love it. Um, I love it. So real, real easy. I mean, you can't really miss something like that. These things just get absolutely ginormous. It looks like a big white pom-pom sitting in the tree. Um, these guys are out and about right now. We're actually picking these. The, the Lediporus sulfaris is the chicken of the woods. Um, so these are really bright orange. You can't miss them. Um, they're, they get very large. They usually fruit in very large groups. Um, the flesh of the mushroom is a lot like a white cooked white chicken breast. So that's where it gets that chicken of the woods name. Um, and you can use it as replacement for chicken to do like chicken tenders. You can do all sorts of stuff. I mean, it's just endless. Um, so there's several varieties up here of this. We have uh, Cincinnatus, which is um, very similar to this one, but it grows either right at the base of the tree or on the ground at the base of the tree. And the pores will be white, so that bottom side of the, that chicken will be white. It's still a chicken, even if it doesn't have that yellow bottom, it's just a different variety of chicken and completely edible. The one thing I like to tell people with this one, one sec, is that if you have any allergies to sulfa drugs, you may have a reaction to this mushroom. Um, I've never had that. I have sulfa allergies and I've never had a reaction to this mushroom, um, but I know people that have. So. If you do have sulfa allergy, that say edible with caution. If you want to try it, try a small piece, wait a day, see how it treats you. Try a little bit more, wait a day, see how it treats you. And if it's, and if it's good to go, it's good to go. Um, but if it's not, you know, it will pass with time. It's nothing you need to go to the hospital for. You're not going to die because of it. Um, you're just going to have a really adverse, we call it shooty booty. That's what's going to go down for you. Um, you're not going to feel well. Um, and it can last up to five days. So just be cautious if you have that allergy. Otherwise, um, this is one of our kids' favorites, absolute favorite mushrooms out there. Um, oak trees is going to be your big chicken tree for the most part. I have seen them on maple, and I've seen them on, um, on the poplar trees as well. So this is an interesting mushroom, and one of my favorites um, is Hypomyces lactiflorum. They're commonly known as lobster mushrooms, and they're actually not. Um, the mushroom itself doesn't, isn't that. It's, it's a parasitic infection on a Lactarius or Rosala um, mushroom. So it's actually a mushroom within a mushroom, kind of. Um, and, and what that does, that parasitic infection actually changes those mushrooms. Those mushrooms, Lactarius, can be red, uh, white. The Rosalas can be red. They can be green. They can be tan. Um, this mushroom will morph all of them. It gets rid of the gills completely. As you can see, I took a picture of the underside of the mushroom. Um, it's flat. It's hard. They're dense. And then it, it kind of, instead of the cap growing in a convex manner where the cap is going up and over the top, it'll actually clam it like this, like a lobster claw. And that's kind of with the color of the name and the, and the lobster claw effect. That's where it gets its name from. But it also smells like it. And oftentimes, if you're in an area where there's a mass fruiting of this going on, you can actually smell, smell fishy 
when you're in the woods and you're like, what is that? It's, it's lobster mushrooms. Um, they they stay dense. They stay hard when you're cook, cooking them. So that's kind of awesome when you're doing like pasta salads and stuff with them. So they're not going to get all mushy like most, most mushrooms do. This one actually keeps that nice dense um, texture to it. Again, oak, ash, and I've seen them running around with white pine too. So we have all the trees you need up here for them. Um, the Calvatica, Giantian, the giant puffball, probably one of the more famous of the mushrooms. Um, this one doesn't really have a tree. It's more metals, lawns, fields, the edges of woods, that kind of thing. Um, late summer to autumn, we do a lot of different fun things with this mushroom. You can chop it up. Um, you can do it in egg drop soup. You can slice the really large pieces in, um, dry them and make them into pizza crust. Um, some people will dry it and powder it and then they use it as a thickener for gravies. There's lots of different ways that you can, you can treat this mushroom. The one thing I tell people with this mushroom is just if you cut it open and it's yellow inside, don't eat it. Um, it's starting to go bad at that point and it would definitely lead to gut rot. So I would stay away from that. Um, bright white in the middle and you're good to go. You can dehydrate these in discs if you want or in cubes. We've done it both ways and they store for a very long time. Um, and then for the pizza crust, after we dehydrate them, we just paint a little olive oil on them. We cook them a little bit, 10 minutes or so in the oven, 350, pull it out, throw your pizza stuff on it, throw it back in, get all your pizza stuff melted, and you're good to go, and you've got a pizza. I'm going to talk a little bit about medicinal mushrooms. Um, this can be really tricky when you're doing um, a slideshow because you never want to complain or proclaim that um, mushrooms will do anything because I'm not a doctor. So what I can do is I can give you the jumping off points for those mushrooms and I can teach you what they are and then the research is going to be on you. So they've been used medicinally for thousands of years by the Chinese and all other tribal cultures. Um, the, they contain vitamin D which is a proven fact but they have a lot of other useful properties and they're currently be, being studied for cancer, Alzheimer's, um, nerve disorders, I mean, cleaning up oil spills, there's just a ton of different stuff going on in our fungi word world. But we have three very useful and easy ones here in Door County to find. So I'm gonna start out with chaga. The first thing I'm gonna say is actually the end of this um, part of the presentation. This fungus is subject to over harvesting and misuse. So those one-time tea bags you're getting online, stop buying them, please. They're not, you're not getting anything out of them. You're really not. This mushroom needs to be, because it's like a conch, it's like a piece of wood, it needs to be soaked for a long period of time. A two-minute steep is really not going to bring you out all those properties that you really want. If you're buying tinctures, that's a different story. Um, if you want to put tinctures in your teas, then you're getting that long-term soak and so on and so forth. Um, it's very particular to the birch trees here in Door County. I find it up here all the time. My, um, my way of describing its flavor when you make it into the tea is like, what if coffee and, and vanilla had a baby is kind of how it tastes. Um, yeah, you'd never think that, but that's, that's really what it's like. It can be a little bitter. Um, you can, once you've made a batch of tea, you can add juice to it. You can add water to it, you can add ice to it, you can throw it in your coffee pot to warm it up. Um, there's lots of different things that you can do it once you have it. But please realize it's medicine. So when people are using this, we're using it as a medicine. You don't take Dayquil every day. So chaga has some antibacterial properties to it. So by constantly having that running through your system, you are messing around with your microbiome. So if you're using it to treat things or trying it for you know, um, some sort of disorder or whatever, you don't want to be doing that all the time without giving your body a break and then building back up your biome because it does kill off some of the beneficial bacteria as well. So that's kind of what I can tell you about this. Um, it's pretty easy to harvest. I tell people don't take a hatchet and a, um, a hammer to these trees. Chaga ripens out in, a, in kind of a block like you can see it in that first picture. You can actually just walk up to it and just push on it hard enough um, with your hand or take a stone and hit it and it will fall off. Um, that's the chunk that you take home. You leave the rest of that stuff that's in the tree in the tree and let it come back. Um, and it will. It, it will regenerate itself. It'll keep growing as long as we keep doing that. 
people are going out there and chiseling this stuff out of the tree. They're damaging the tree and they're damaging the chaga and then the chaga is not going to come back. So um, I had to make a choice as, as an amateur mycologist as to whether or not to even talk about this mushroom. I decided that education is more important than avoidance. Um, some people won't even talk about it because they don't want people harvesting it anymore and they don't want the information out there. Um, <clears throat> I just figure that if we don't tell people what's wrong with it or the way that they're doing it, um, we're never gonna change anything. So so um, that's that's our chaga. We have Ganoderma tissue or a, a form of reishi um, that grows here in Door County, mostly on the hemlock trees. It's been used for medicine for years and years and years. Um, it's been proclaimed to have so many different benefits, slowing and eliminating cancer is one of them, heart and lung benefits. Um, so just really educate yourself when you're using these, these mushrooms. There's so much information online on how to use them, how to store them, how to, to get enough, or and even how to dose it properly. All of that information is out there. So if you're really into this whole thing, Get out there and do it. Don't collect more than you can use um, because then you're just wasting it. You know, ever if you know people that could use it as well, pass that mushroom on. I do that frequently when I get a lot of stuff. I'll just pass it on to the neighbor. Um, so how I handle it when I do find it is I slice it up, I dry it in a food dehydrator, and then I make teas. And sometimes I throw the chaga and the reishi in the same tea bath that when I'm making the teas. So I'm getting a little bit of both. Um, I don't know like if I don't know if it's necessarily like something that I think everybody should do. Um, I think that you should use it if you can find a use for it in your life. Otherwise, take a photo and, and move on. They're really cool mushrooms, but again, there's not a lot of them up here. So just be responsible when you're harvesting. And then my all time favorite. So hands down, favorite mushroom is not morels, sorry. I don't mean to disappoint you all, but it's just not. Um, my favorite is Hen of the Woods. Um, and the reason that I like this mushroom so much is the flavor and because of how it handles itself when you're trying to save it. So it freezes perfectly. It dries perfectly. It comes back from all of that perfectly. <laughs> and it always holds on to that same flavor. So. Well, that's one of the things with mushrooms is that when you're trying to dry them or freeze them or so on and so forth, and some are better one way or the other, this one I've not found that. I've just found that it works out really well no matter what, and it holds on to that nice, strong, nutty flavor. Um, older oaks is where you're going to find it. Um, that's, that's their tree of choice, um, and good luck beating me to the old oaks in this county. Um, I'm on it. <laughs> I know where they are. Um, but it's totally worth it. It's totally worth it. So they can be a bit buggy, just clean them up. Um, and then I chop them up and I freeze them in portion bags. That's how I deal with it. Um, it's like I said, one of my favorites. So light, nutty, nutty flavor and real easy to take care of once you take it home. Quickly go over these poisonous lookalikes. Um, so let's talk about morels just for a second here. They're very similar to, to regular morels. The false morels are in a lot of ways, and I can see why people would confuse some of them. One of the things with um, the Enscalata is that they have a high amount of monomethylhydrazine, hence the photograph. Monomethylhydrazine is the same, one of the components of rocket fuel. So it can be a very gassy mushroom, and it can cause some problems for you with your liver. There's a few of them that you just don't mess with. There's a lot of new science saying that you can eat these things. I've chosen not to. You guys can do what you will. I don't want to be responsible for it though. Um, it's, it's one of those things where I'm talking about like high ventilated area, cooking it outside. There are so many other really good things to eat in the woods that you don't have to mess around with that. If you're one of those people that wants to mess around with it, by all means more power to you, but I just choose not to. There's enough morels for me. I don't need to. So um, proper prep, prep and storage is really important with this specific mushroom. And here's a few examples of false morels. Now, some of these are considered good edibles um, if you prepare them correctly. Um, and like I said, here at, at our house, we just choose not to. There's the Verpa bohemica, which is one that looks really close to those blonde morels. Um, some people call them the thimble cap. 
when you cut these open, they're gonna have cotton inside. Remember when I told you about morels at first, they were gonna be empty, they're gonna be hollow. Um, if you cut it open, it has that cottony inside, then you're really not dealing with a regular morel, you're dealing with that burpa morel. Um, this morel, I've been told, is edible. Um, some people eat just the cat, some people will eat the whole thing. I still have people reporting flu-like symptoms, so I'm never gonna recommend it. Um, I don't do that with, with mushrooms where I feel like there's any chance you're gonna get sick from it. I won't tell you to eat it. So they are out there, they're cool mushroom, use at your own risk. Um, they grow at the same time as all your other mushrooms do, so be careful when you're cutting your mushrooms open. If it is something that you wanna avoid, you need to cut your mushrooms open to check the inside of them. Because if you look at that cap, I mean, that looks very much like a normal morale. Um, and here's a side-by-side -side photo just to show you how very similar they are. Again, if you cut that open though, there's gonna be cotton in the middle. Here's your look-alike to that chanterelle mushroom. And the reason that I keep these photos separate is because I just wanna talk about what these look-alikes are and what their, their difference are. This one is actually bioluminescent, where the chanterelle is not, so that means it can glow in the dark. Um, it's usually found around the stumps of the oak trees. We don't have a high population of these here, but I have seen them. So it's just something you wanna be a little careful with when you're picking your chanterelles. Um, the neat thing about um, these guys, the jack-o'-lanterns, is that they grow kind of in a cluster. They can grow singly, but they kind of grow a lot and they're much, much larger than chanterelles. So if you see them in an older stage of life, you might be able to recognize them a little bit better, but there is a trick and here it is. So side by side, chanterelles, are that light yellow and it looks like the gills were pressed on and then if you look at the jack-o'-lantern on the other side which has that darker orange color and the gills freely move and by freely move you can take your finger and put it on the gills and move the gills back and forth just doing this if you can do that nine chances out of ten it's probably not going to be a chanterelle large chanterelles can have a little bit of gill you can see the edges of the in the first picture um, but they will never move freely like the jack lantern mushroom. Another little close-up of what I mean. So they have the ridges, a smooth, blunt, forking. That's more like somebody took a, a press and pressed the gills on, whereas the other ones are free gills. They can flap if you move your finger across. They're very thin, they're deep, and they're very delicate. They'll fall apart. When you start moving them around, they'll just kind of crumble and start falling apart. Chanterelle gills usually don't do that. So you harvested mushrooms, now what? How am I doing on time? Am I doing all right on time? Yeah, yeah you're doing good. Yeah. About 15 minutes yet. Um, so I, I talked about this a little bit, the cutting off the stems with your knife, wiping away your bugs, your grease, your brush, all that stuff. That, that's just a really good way to keep your harvest clean. Um, it makes your job easier when you get home. The mycelium, the dirt clumps, the bugs, the leaf litter, all that junk, just leave it in the woods. That's where it's supposed to be. It does not belong in your sink. Your sink will thank you. Your plumber's not gonna get paid, but whatever, it's probably better for him not to be. Um, soaking your mushrooms in salt water will cause your mushrooms to break down very quickly. Yep, that it will. Um, so I, I see this a lot in forums where people will take their mushrooms home and they think they need to soak them in salt water and that they're gonna get all the bugs out and you're not. You're just not. Um, I've seen people do experiments where they're, they're putting these mushrooms in water for a half an hour, just straight water, no bugs come out. And then they take those same mushrooms that all the bugs were supposed to come out and they go and throw them in another container with a drop of dish soap and no bugs come out. And then you take them out of that container and you split them open with your knife and guess what's inside? Bugs. Um, it just, it's not worth it. You're just breaking down all of that stuff. How do you get bugs out? By hand. By hand, it's work. You have to work for it. You have to go in there and you have to clean them out. Um, there's a, a couple little tricks I can teach you along the way here. Um, the other thing that with the soaking in salt water, they'll do that and then they throw them in the oven to try their mushrooms out and all their mushrooms turn black. That's why. Um, that salt dries it out and it just changes the whole consistency of the mushroom. So we don't soak our mushrooms at all. There's no reason to. We rinse them off, we get the dirt out, we check them for bugs. If they're buggy, we don't eat them. Um, and if they have bugs in them and we didn't know, we just say meat group. Um, so there's that. 
Um, they're going to absorb all the water that they're soaking in, so it causes them to lose flavor and texture, and then it turns any of the dirt and mud and everything else that you have, if you're not cleaning your mushrooms, into just a huge mess for you. And then you have to clean your mushrooms for longer, you have to put more water on them, it's just a vicious cycle, it's totally not worth it. So, plastic, ver plastic versus paper. Um, so, we don't ever really store our stuff in, in plastic bags, ever. I don't pick with plastic and I don't store with plastic. I use paper bags. Um, that moisture is going to beat up on the outside of the bag. It's going to make your mushrooms slimy. They're going to rot really fast. You take your mushrooms and you throw them in a paper bag, write your date on it that you picked them, um, and you can put them in your crisper drawer or anywhere in your refrigerator. Um, your mushrooms can last sometimes even upwards of a month, maybe longer. You can even do that with your store-bought mushrooms. You can bring your mushrooms home. You can get them out of those whatever plastic and styrofoam packaging and throw them in a paper bag and put them in your crisper drawer and they're gonna last you a lot longer than what they would if you just left them sit in those containers. So, um, let's see, paper bags allow your mushrooms to breathe. Yeah, that's super important. Um, they are food, you know, and, and get air getting to them is a good thing. Um, and then I talked about this whole thing with you wanna get the bugs out. So here's one little trick that works for me. Um, I will put them in a gallon bag. If, if specifically I do this with trumpets, um, I'll take black trumpets and I put them in a gallon bag and I'll, I'll try to get all the air out of it and then I'll seal it up and I'll leave it sit on my counter for a little bit. If there are any maggots or worms or anything in those or ants or whatever, everything tries to come out because there's no air and it all sticks to the side of the bag. And then you can open up your bag and dump your mushrooms out and your mushrooms are gonna be clean. It's just one of the ways to do it. You might have a few bugs here or there, but I highly doubt it. Um, we'll talk about storage shortly here. Um, again, paper bags in the refrigerator. Um, each mushroom has a different shelf life, so don't assume that your chicken of the woods is going to last as long as your morels and vice versa. They all have a different shelf life. Just keep checking them. If they start getting slimy, start turning really brown, they start getting mushy, don't eat them. It's just a, a world of hurt if you do. Um, Freezing trick um, that we use, you can lay your mushrooms out on a cookie sheet so that they're not touching, they're all separate. Throw it in your freezer, freeze it, pull it back out, and then you can take it in portions. So do like a quart size bag of all your chanterelles. Doing this keeps them from all sticking together and becoming one big mushy mess that you have to try to break apart like a brick. Um, and it's just real easy then you give your, your little bags of all different kinds of mushrooms, you just grab your little quart bag out and you know you have chanterelles for dinner. Um, dehydrating. I do dehydrate a few few varieties of the mushrooms. Um, one of the mushrooms that I don't dehydrate is I don't dehydrate chicken in the woods, ever. It does not come back from it. I, it's just turned into cardboard. Um, I really, really suggest people freezing those. Just cut them up, clean them up, freeze them. Um, most of the other ones you can get away with dehydrating. I'm not real fond of how chanterelles come back from, dehyd from dehydrating either. I would prefer those frozen. Um, but you know, you have to experiment a little bit with what you like, you know, what textures do you like? Do you like things a little bit harder? Do you like, um, them a little bit more mushy? Some people will actually dry and just make powders. You can make trumpet cells. You can make any, any mushroom really, you can kind of dehydrate and run it through your coffee grinder with salt and make salt and save them that way. Um, there's a lot of different techniques for, for storing them. So, um, some people dehydrate and then they freeze them. Um, that's, that's a thing as well. So you can kind of look into that if you, if you're interested. Uh, little brown mushrooms are really not for beginners. Most of them aren't edible. Um, same goes for little white mushrooms. I'm not trying to create mycophobia here. I'm just saying for beginners. I'm not saying don't take pictures of them. I'm not saying don't ask questions. I'm just telling you that the vast majority of them are not edible. So if you see a whole group of little tiny itty bitty brown mushrooms all over a log and you pick all of them thinking they're edible and you take them home they're going to be surely disappointed. Um, there are a few brown mushrooms that will grow in masses like that but those are something that maybe you should wait until you're a little bit more experienced and get to know what those are. Do your homework. Don't go buy any of those myths or wives tale if you throw a copper penny in a pot with it. it it's edible. Don't think that anything that's orange is edible don't you know don't go buy any of that stuff there's a one-way ticket to the hospital or shooty booty for an entire week don't do it use your books your groups experienced hunters they can be deadly so just 
just use the resources around you. Um, I'm available. Please use me. Send me messages. Come see me at work. Whatever you got to do. You want to learn about mushrooms. I'm more than willing to teach you. Don't shove it in your face until you've asked enough questions. Learn how to make spore prints. I'm going to actually talk about that in a minute. Um, and then be prepared. So if you're asking all sorts, of, get the information about the mushrooms so that when you're asking questions and I'm asking you questions, you can answer it. Sometimes I can tell you what things are if I know exactly what tree it was on or was it in soil? Was it only growing in sand? Was it leaf litter? Was it a log? What tree was it near? Give me pictures, not pictures, one picture of one mushroom from 15 feet away. Probably not going to be able to answer that. Get up there, take a picture of that cap, that stem, um, base, what it's growing with, whatever. Give me some information and I can try to help you ID it. If I don't know what it is, I have enough friends in this world in the mycology land that I could probably ask one of them and at least get you a solid ID. If you're in doubt, throw it out. Don't even, don't even, oh, maybe, eh, it's just not something to mess around with. You don't want to get sick from mushrooms. It's not a good time. Um, every mushroom's edible, but some are only edible once, so be careful with that. And I just want to talk about spore prints for a second here. Um, if I ask you to make a spore print, or if you made a spore print, a real easy way for you to do that is to take your mushroom, chop the stem off of it, and throw it on a piece of paper. I choose blue because there's not very many mushrooms out there that have blue spores. So I choose blue. Um, I throw it on a piece of paper. You can put a bowl or a cup or however big the mushroom is. Just put it over the top of it and leave it sit overnight. The next day, you're going to have a print. And I'm going to ask you what color is it. Is it tan? Is it white? Is it buff? Is it blue? What color is it? Um, and that might help me nail down a species um, if, if we're looking. So palm taking class with me. You now have access to asking questions and get ideas. You're welcome to message me on Facebook on either my personal page. You can do that on Wild Door Mushrooms and Foraging if you want. And I can also be found working at Door Karma Farms on Highway 57 between Bailey's Harbor and Sister Bay. Please realize I have other jobs. So if I don't get back to you right away, it isn't that I'm trying to be rude or avoid you. It's just I'm, I'm probably working, but I will try to get back to you right away. Um, this is my disclaimer in legalese. Um, I'm not responsible if you eat it. I'm just not. Um, if you need questions, please ask them. Um, we're, we're just still want to be responsible for anybody that decides to eat anything. Um, you do everything at your own risk. Presentation is the property of Wild Thor. There's my credits, and there's me walking away. So, anybody have any questions? Um, was there any questions that came in? So, Janine came in. You haven't met Janine yet, but she's our branch manager. She came in. Okay. Um, so Janine Brennan, she's our interim branch manager at Egg Harbor. So hi Janine. Hi, you led me on a um, a trip last year with the ridges over I bet I did. Memorial Day. Yep. And looking for morels, and uh, I have them in my yard now. Oh Pretty boy, big, big ones. Yeah. That's awesome. Very yeah. cool. Yeah. Very cool. Um. Hey Mike, did you have a question? If you wanna, I can. You want to come on and ask it? Otherwise, sure. Yeah, it was, uh, when you said drying and then freezing, I, for morels, I've only dried them. Does it hurt to then freeze them after drying them? Kind no. of to avoid maybe mold or something like that. No, you can you can do both. Um, a lot of people only dry their morels. I've I've tried it all different ways. Um, I experiment a lot with different mushrooms to see how what I like best. Um, if you dry them and then soak them, they come back just fine. And if you freeze them, when you bring them back, they're kind of wet and watery and you got to let all that moisture come off of them when you're cooking them. That's the only thing with freezing is that you get that extra moisture in there. So the first thing I do when I'm dealing with that situation is I'm kind of frying them for a little while by themselves, just to eliminate the water, get the water off the mushroom. And then you can start adding in your oils, your spices, your butters, your whatever, and the mushroom will suck it right back up. If you do it from straight from frozen, whether they were dried and frozen or not, you're still gonna have that moisture content in there. So, and then your your recipe gets kind of muddy. You know, you just, you don't get those tight flavors that you could if you get that water off of them, so. Thanks. Yeah. Um, another technical question, 
What kind of um, bug spray do you wear out there? I mean, man, the mosquitoes are thick. Right. What do you recommend? Okay, so there there are tricks to that trade. Um, I do a couple different things. One of my favorite products is Sawyer's. Um, Sawyer's has a pyrethrin type spray. I treat my clothing with that, and I use that same clothing quite a bit when I'm out mushroom hunting. Um, so it's kind of a pre-treat thing, but I also drag it along because, you know, when you get sweaty and whatever else when you're out there, and sometimes the, the bugs are just thick as thieves, and you, you need that spray to go right on your pants while you're going out. But then I also use the Deep Woods Off. And the reason that I use a deep-based product is because I don't want to get any sort of sickness from ticks. I've had enough ticks on my system. Like, I can't even tell you. I probably get 50 to 100 ticks a year doing what I do. So, you know, for me, it's it's either I get a disease from a tick or I, <laughs> I use deep. I try not to spray it on my face, my hands, things I'm touching the mushrooms with, whatever. But I do do use it on my clothing. Um, the Sawyer's product keeps most of the ticks off, the black flies away, and the gnats away. Um, the uh, the deep space sprays are more for mosquitoes um, than it is really for ticks. Ticks don't seem to care whether you have deep woods off on or not. They, they don't care. Very good information. That's part of the part of the reason why I can't hunt mushrooms because I get you know all the mosquitoes. They're just they're insane. They get they are something. they're insane. People use those. Um, they have those like little clip-on fans. I forget what that's called right offhand. Um, but they have them that just clip your clothing too. That kind of dispel um, a product out in the air around you. That helps keep them down. And I had some kids even at the Ridges camps that were wearing those. Um, and Instead of wearing the deep woods, their parents didn't want them being sprayed. So they opted for these little fans that they could wear that were pushing a product off into the air. And then some people use those bracelets. The kids would wear bracelets sometimes too that had the deep products on them. Um, I've never used any of that stuff. I've always just kind of stuck with my sprays and was diligent. Um, another thing too, when you're out there and you tuck your tuck your socks in, your pants into your socks, tuck your shirt in. Um, I know you're not out there for a fashion show. You're out there to pick <laughs> mushrooms. Nobody cares what you're wearing, really. I mean, they don't. And if they do, whatever, you know, just smile and wave. Um, but it's, doing that can help a lot, you know, because the ticks can go up the legs of the pants. They go up the shirt, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, some of those preventative things can be helpful, too. Um, is there any other... Morgan, do, were there any questions on Facebook that you can see? Um, most of the things on Facebook are um, just very interested. A lot of people said very interesting. Thank you from Patricia. Um, Alora said, thank you. Can't wait to start hunting. Lori said, thank you. So interesting. And Jake said, good job. Uh, another <laughs> Patricia mentioned that she just wanted to see the tree ID pics again. And then I will just say that we are going to be um, posting this on YouTube as well as it stays on our Facebook pages. So you can always click into the video section of both the Crest um, Facebook page and then on the Door County Library um, Facebook page and you can watch them again and pause it too. Yeah, and if, you know, if they want some of that information on the IDs, so those were just pictures I slapped on there for more of a cosmetic effect if they're really jazzed about learning that end of things, just contact me and I'll teach you how to do it. It's, it's real easy. I can send you some links. I've got a lot of stuff stored. Um, I have no problem with people reaching out to me to get the information they need to hunt. I want everybody to be able to do it. You know? So please feel free to contact me somehow and, and I'll get you the link you need for, those, for the silhouettes and the tree bark ID stuff. Shannon, do you have a favorite book for IDs? Um, that we can get at the library? Yeah, um, so Michael Kuo, he just put out Mushrooms of the Midwest. Um, it was a couple years back that he did that. That's very updated information. Um, Kuo just really has a real sound grasp on the ID, all the updates. One of the neat things with Mushrooms is that they're now doing like, um, they're doing DNA sequencing. So some of the mushrooms that we thought were in some groups because we were basing on characteristics actually aren't even related. So they've, they've gotten down to this whole DNA sequencing and cool keeps up with all of that. So 
the names are changing on the mushrooms. You can still use some of the old names. And in fact, some of my slides had some of the old names on them. Um, it'll get you to where you need to go for the updated new name, but he's really one of my favorite authors, hands down. And then Tavis Lynch just put out a book um, just specifically on bull leaf. And it's a, it's a very common, or yeah, I think it was bull leaf. Um, it's a really common book or a really common mushroom in Door County the Boleith and the Rusala. Those are two very, very common mushrooms. And Tavis is putting out a book on both of those. Um, and he's got also one on growing mushrooms at home too. That's fantastic. A lot of the stuff that that guy does is just phenomenal. And in fact, he's one of the guys that helps me run that. Um, he's the main curator for the Lady Spray up in Rice Lake, Wisconsin. So um, just a really great wealth of information. Super, really great dude. Um, really like him and I like his books. He's really on point with everything. Great. Thank you for the recommendations. All right. Any other questions from anybody? Well, Shannon, thank you so much for learning, learning the new Zoom skill yeah. and um, for teaching me. <laughs> spending time with us this afternoon. Um, so Morgan, do you have any announcements for things we have coming up? Well, my biggest announcement is that the summer reading program is starting next Monday and we are utilizing an app called Beanstack. So that's B-E-A-N-S-T-A-C-K and it is live right now. So you can find that at your app store, download it. It looks like a little blue um, background with a white heart and you can search for Door County Library and um, register for summer reading program. And what we are doing this year is, um, of course, reading minutes, and then um, you have to do activities. So either coming to one of these right now would count towards that activity, and you are put in for weekly prize drawings of gift certificates from Destination Door County, which is the Door County's Visitors Bureau, that have no expiration date on them. And um, so like I said, weekly drawings and or you can choose to put your tickets in for books. So um, we, it's all open. You can actually visit our website at doorcountylibrary.org and see um, our summer page and find some of the, or read through some of the things that we have going on. There's so many activities going on. I'm already exhausted by next week. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and then on Thursday, we are having um, David LaLuzerne. He's an herbalist. He is doing a program about vitamin and mineral supplements. So that's happening Thursday at 2. But that's all I have. Great. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming. And sorry I was late. Uh, it was pretty busy here, even though it's just me in the library. There's lots going on with people picking up books. So um, we've been busy. All, well, right. Well, All right. Well, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a good afternoon. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks, Thanks Shannon. Bye, guys. Thanks, Shannon. Bye. Bye. Bye.